whether you believe it to be the one true money or whether you think of it as nothing more than an inert lump of metal, gold has been man's obsession for 6,000 years. I'm Grant Williams, and in the first part of our journey, we explain the history of gold and how this strange yellow metal has captured the hearts and minds of men for thousands of years. We showed you how gold mining has evolved over the centuries and demonstrated the complexities of refining and casting gold. And we took you underground for a never before filmed look at the most secretive gold vault in the world. We looked at the history of the gold standard and saw how a president's decision to close the gold window in 1971 profoundly changed the world around us. And perhaps most importantly, we showed you why gold became and remains money. In the second part of our journey, we'll look at the difference between Eastern and Western attitudes towards gold. We'll explain the difference between gold ETFs and the physical metal and why that makes the gold price different to the price of gold. We'll ask the all important question, is the gold price manipulated and if so, by whom? Finally, we'll talk about the possible future of gold. What role, if any, could cryptocurrencies play? And is Bitcoin the new gold or just another doomed alternative to the only money that stood the test of time? While it's been used as money and a store of value for thousands of years, man's relationship with gold goes much, much deeper, and its place in history extends far beyond coins, bars, and jewelry. We begin the second and final installment of our journey with a look at some of the properties of this remarkable yellow metal. Gold's durability means that just about every ounce ever mined is still above ground today, refined and recast many times over. A ring bought today in a souk in Dubai may contain traces of gold that once graced the neck of Cleopatra. That's just one of the many interesting facts about gold. Gold is among the rarest of the elements, making up only three parts per billion of the Earth's crust. If you want to know how hard that makes gold to find, picture a billion M&Ms, and somewhere in amongst that pile, there are just three made of gold. Gold weighs 19 times more than water and is twice as heavy as lead. Over 90% of the world's existing above-ground gold has been mined since the California Gold Rush. And if all the existing gold in the world was pulled into a wire five microns thick, it could wrap around the world 11.2 million times. Throughout history, man has mined 188,000 tons of gold. To put that into perspective, you could place all of it into two Olympic-sized swimming pools. But it's not just bars in a vault or rings on fingers. Gold has many other uses. In fact, aside from its monetary and symbolic value, gold is widely used in electronics and electrical wiring, dentistry, medicine, radiation shielding, and to color glass. In fact, more gold can be recovered from a ton of computers than from 17 tons of gold ore. Even the human body contains about 0.2 milligrams of gold, which is found mostly in our blood. By far the largest above ground stock of gold resides in the secure vaults of the world's central banks. In total, the top 10 central banks in the world own some 23,000 tons of gold. And the IMF owns another 2,000 tons. This equates to around 12% of all the gold ever mined. Throughout thousands of years of history, gold's remarkable elemental properties have provided an incredibly stable store of value. But those same properties have led many critics to look upon it as a boring asset, which they claim in the long term offers low returns at best. This viewpoint, however, completely misses the point of gold's place in a portfolio because perhaps counterintuitively, boredom is actually one of its most attractive qualities. Well, critics argue that it provides boring returns because they're thinking of gold as an investment. Gold doesn't provide, shouldn't provide any return and it's not an investment. The reason gold doesn't provide any return is because it doesn't have any risk, and there's no return without risk. So a $100 bill doesn't provide any return unless you deposit it in the bank, at which point it's no longer a $100 bill, it's a liability of the bank. And you are the creditor with the risk of the bank not paying you back. And the biggest risk that it doesn't have, which all financial assets have in Trumps, and that is uh, the risk of permanent impairment. In other words, the risk of permanent loss of value. Gold price can go up, it can go down, but gold itself is permanent. Gold is, a, is an excellent um, hedge in times of rising inflation. 
um, while in deflation it works pretty well but you shouldn't focus on prices then. Then you should really focus on, uh, uh, on the purchasing power. Because if gold goes down 10% and stock prices go down 70%, it's still pretty good, I would say, yeah, because you're just increasing, you're massively increasing your purchasing power. If you think about the set of circumstances that allows gold to do well, they're always, not always, but they're often catastrophic circumstances. So I would agree with you Gold offers boring returns. Boring returns like $35 in 1971, and what, $1,250 today? If you think about the returns of other asset classes that don't offer up insurance, give me that boredom. To many people, gold is simply a price on a TV screen or a computer terminal, and it's often nothing more than the fluctuations in this price in both directions, which are used to determine whether owning gold has been a successful investment or not. But is this fixation on its price the correct way to think about gold? And if not, then what is? People focus on the price of gold, but also people focus on the price of everything. It, it, this is a product of financialization. People know the price of everything and the value of nothing. Financialization has ushered a period where markets uh, price everything. And so people can track prices of everything and the value they're worth by the amount of dollar units that they, that they have. People who are very focused on the amount of money they have should move to Japan because they would have 100 times more money because Japanese yen is 100 to $1. So if you want to be a millionaire, you can do it a lot faster there than you can do it here. Yes, a lot of people uh, invest in gold and they get very upset because gold goes up or down in price and they think they, they bought at the wrong time or they sold at the wrong time. Of course, th this is the wrong way to think about it because the reason gold's been money for thousands of years is because it's the most stable element. And what's really happening, of course, is that the dollar is going up and down in terms of gold, not vice versa. And it is true. Uh, that you can make lots of money in speculations. Uh, fiat currencies do go up in value occasionally. In fact, even in the middle of the Weimar hyperinflation, uh, the mark would have sudden huge surges higher. And people who'd levered themselves up in, in gold and basically shorted the mark would get uh, cleaned out. And this happens today in the gold market too. So, so people really shouldn't focus on the gold price. They should focus on preserving their capital. And gold does that. Gold preserves your purchasing power. In fact, gold increases your purchasing power over time, and, and uh, it's best not to get too cute uh, when, when you're in a, a, a sinking ship, which is what the U.S. dollar is right now. I think unless you really understand the structure of the global gold market, it's a little bit of a fool's errand to focus solely on the, what the price of gold is. So, for example, since 2013 in particular, early 2013, we've seen significant flows, physical flows, out of the West, going broadly defined East, uh, China uh, in particular. Um, and those physical flows have not driven, they actually have driven a decline in the price. And since late 2013, the price has effectively gone nowhere, even as physical flows have moved. And so when I say if you focus solely on the price, I think you're, you're, you lose a lot of informational value or the, the, the full mosaic of what's actually happening. Whilst people will fixate on the gold price, there's a very distinct difference between the gold price and the price of gold. The price of gold refers to the cost of putting a coin or a bar in your hand. It represents the cost of the physical metal itself. Meanwhile, the gold price has become nothing more than a reference point, a number by which any number of paper gold products are priced on a daily basis all around the world. But what do we mean by paper gold? And why is the astonishing rise of these derivative contracts potentially very, very dangerous. Uh, these are contracts, so I say paper, it's really a contractual relation, it takes many forms, that give you exposure to the price of gold, but don't give you actual gold. And there are many of them, so what are they? A, a gold future on the COMEX, the Commodity Exchange, part of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. So a COMEX gold future would be paper gold. A gold ETF, a GLD is the leading one. A GLD, okay, so the ETF, for example. I'm not buying gold, a lot of people think they are. I'm buying a share of a stock that's traded on the New York Stock Exchange. That share of stock entitles me to um, basically price exposure. And when I sell it, I'm not selling it back to the vault. I'm selling it to an, somebody else who wants to buy it. Paper gold represents gold that is circulated in certificated form. So one example of paper gold might be GLD, the uh, ETF 
which is a derivative, really, of gold that trades on the New York Stock Exchange. It's efficient for holders because you don't have to go down to a bullion shop, pick it up, expose yourself to being, mug, being mugged, and bury it in the backyard. It doesn't, however, represent physical gold. And for people who are nervous about the financial system, the fact that they own a derivative when what they really want is payment in fist is very difficult for them. Paper gold is basically the futures market, I would say. Um, there's huge volume in the, in the futures, futures markets. And my perspective has always been, um, if you want to buy gold, um, for safety reasons, um, to, 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 to hedge against uh, financial disaster or whatever, you have to buy physical gold. You, you don't want to have any counterparty. Uh, you have to have the real thing. Um, if you want to speculate with it, of course you can buy um, uh, paper gold, but it's just not the real thing. The difference between owning a paper contract or claim on gold versus holding the metal itself, while seemingly trivial, is a hugely significant one. The idea of owning a paper claim on physical gold, however, is viewed very differently in the West than it is in the East. After countless episodes of inflation and where the debasement of fiat currencies by governments is commonplace, gold is viewed very differently indeed. There is a deeper cultural familiarity with gold. Uh, when I give the sort of gold lecture as an example to young South Asian women, they laugh at me. They say, in our culture, we have 1,500 years' experience with gold. We have known for a much longer time than you that the government is not our friend, that we need a medium of exchange that's simultaneously a store of value. My suspicion is that any culture that has less rather than more social trust has a greater affinity for gold, because gold traditionally has been something that obviated the need for trust. Uh, the West did have for a hundred years or, or so or longer, uh, very credible governments, limited government. Uh, Eastern governments have not had such a happy history of limited government allowing the people to, to uh, the freedom, the liberty to hold money as they see fit. And therefore, uh, Eastern uh, uh, populations tend to trust their governments less and, and sensibly so. And so I think that the, that the idea that gold is money uh, uh, never faded in the East the way it did in the West because no one ever trusted uh, uh, fiat, uh, fiat currency from, from those governments. Uh, so it's, it's a lesson that we relearned in the West, um, I, I think fairly shortly, but, uh, but I think that, that is an important distinction. It's not blanket sort of East versus West on this one because I would say that, com that there's, a, there's definitely a sort of distinction there between um, what I would call traditionally stable countries and traditionally unstable countries because you know I think in Singapore for instance or Hong Kong yeah the older generations you know they, they still think of gold as the ultimate form of money it's a sort of safe haven yeah 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 um, but the young don't right so they they trust their government's money that is less true um, in some of the poorer current poorer countries the old have never trusted their currency uh, in, uh, um, in Indonesia, for instance, or India. They've been right not to, by the way. And, um, and the young don't much either. That, weirdly, has served them extraordinarily well um, relative to the developed world. I think the difference between the way that gold is viewed in the East versus the way gold is viewed in the West is, is probably at its core a function of history. I think it's been, for people in the West and people in the U.S. in particular, it's been a very long time since the U.S. has had a problem with its currency, a problem with sovereign insolvency. It's a, part of that's a function of, uh, you know, this exorbitant privilege we've had since since the, uh, the gold window was closed in 1971. Whereas people in the East have had much more recent familiar personal experience uh, with with currency problems, with currency depreciation. And there's a greater degree of skepticism in the East. Uh, and, and like I said, more importantly, a greater degree of real experience in having these currency depreciation from which gold protected them. You know, I think the other reality is in the West, and I think it's a real credit to policymakers in the West, uh, financiers in the West, there have been, particularly again in the U.S., 
much uh, there's a much greater degree of ability to manage uh, financial asset prices. Um, you know, the creation there's a there's a great declassified U.S. document from 1974 from the U.S. Embassy in London saying. You know, the creation of a large, a very large paper gold futures market would go a long way in managing the price of gold because it, and, and it would therefore reduce American demand for physical gold. And, you know, that would be a good thing. Um, it's right there in black and white. You can see it. It's an official U.S. history. Uh, I just attended a, a conference in Singapore and people don't care about prices. They constantly accumulate gold. They regard it as, as, as a currency, as money. Uh, they don't really care about the prices. Yeah? They just want to own gold, lots of gold. While in the West, I think um, we tend to buy very pro-cyclical. Um, Normally, if, if, if you follow ETF demand, for example, yeah, ETF demand always goes up when prices go up. Yeah? Um, so I think it's more momentum driven. On the other hand, if I compare the attitude regarding gold, for example, in, in Austria, where I come from, or in Germany, I think in our sort of monetary DNA, there's still the hyperinflation because our grandparents, they basically, they lost everything. While people in the United States, they're still kind of traumatized from, from the Great Depression and from deflation. And I think this also kind of explains why our central banks are acting very, very differently. The Chinese in, the, in, in this century have been buying gold. They virtually had nothing 12 years ago. And today they have bought more than or as much as the annual production of gold every year. And then now have, nobody knows how much the Chinese have, but they probably have 20,000 tons of gold. Whatever, um, whatever the split is between central and private, we don't know. But they certainly have now more gold than anybody else. Since the first gold futures contract was launched in 1972, there's been a strong move towards paper gold in the West. Futures contracts and latterly an explosion of ETFs have meant there are now any number of ways to own a paper claim of sorts on the ultimate physical asset without actual ownership. However, this idea of owning paper gold isn't restricted to individual investors. Over the years, even central banks in the West have traded in their physical gold for paper contracts or promises, this time in the form of leasing agreements to the so-called bullion banks. But why do Western investors prefer ETFs over physical gold? And how could that preference potentially come back to bite them? Well, people prefer ETFs for not just for gold. I mean, you, we, we see a massive shift from active management to passive management. And I think one of the reasons for that is during the, in the stage of financialization, you know, larger companies, larger capitalization companies are on average are doing better than small companies because of economies of scale and because of uh, cheaper borrowing costs and so forth, which is, again, is, is anti-competitive product of financialization, product of the type of system that we now, credit-based system that we now have, um, oligarchical system that we now have. Uh, and so uh, in that type of environment, you know, ETF are easy, they're cheap, uh, and they are um, equities. And if you think about gold specifically, uh, you have to think of the structural nature of the asset management industry, where most managers have, now all the managers have what's called a mandate, which is they have uh, a policy that says what they can buy and what they cannot buy. B almost all managers have a mandate to buy equities. Very few managers have a mandate to buy commodities, particularly physical commodities. And so uh, to buy a physical commodity, there has to be a, a whole process of uh, approving it through committees and so forth, whereas they can buy you know, an ETF, which is just a stock, uh, any minute of the day and they don't have any issues with that. E ETFs sol sol solve a problem that just, just doesn't exist. I mean, you know, they, 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 they bill it as a kind of, oh, it's so easy, you can trade with it through your, your uh, Charles Schwab account or something like that. Oh, yeah, fair enough. But, you know, Charles Schwab could easily trade, you know, if they, if, they, if, they, if they weren't getting a sort of kickback of some form, although they must be in some way, shape or form, um, from the ETF providers, um, they could easily they could easily have us as a counterparty, and we could we could trade physical gold. And instead of having an ETF and you know essentially a, a, an equity with an underlying relationship with gold, they could have physical gold, right? And that's not difficult to do. 
you know, it's just, it's just a function of looking up on the internet, spending five minutes on Google and finding a firm like ours, filling out a few forms and, you know, Bob's your father's brother kind of thing. Uh, it's, not, it's not difficult at all. If you own gold to speculate on the price, uh, then of course ETF is probably fine. If you, if you want to own gold as a insurance or as an insurance or as a hedge, uh, and I don't mean financial hedge, I mean a real hedge, protection, against uh, monetary disorder, against uh, financial uh, system, then of course owning it inside financial system doesn't make any sense. So let's say in the case of GLD, I don't know what it is today, but it ranges in the 10% range or so. So that means that for every 100 shares of GLD, there's actually 110 shares out there, outstanding, 10 of which being borrowed and sold short. So there are more shares than there are actual real shares. And I think that's, a pro that's not a problem in the normal market, but that's a problem precisely in the type of a situation when you need your gold as insurance. So all of these types of risks that ETFs bring, which are 100% correlated to the misfortunes, potential misfortunes of capital markets, uh, financial institutions, and monetary system, are precisely why you own gold. So why would you want to commingle the two? Why would you take the risks that you're not going to get paid when the time to get paid Comes. Because of its fascination for mankind, gold has always been surrounded by conspiracy theories and stories of price suppression and manipulation. That's really no surprise. After all, wherever you find money, you inevitably find human beings trying to cheat in some way or another. Fake gold bars have frequently surfaced over the years, with gold-plated tungsten, which has an identical density to gold, being the most common substitute. Fortunately, any one of a number of very simple tests will provide a conclusive answer as to whether a particular bar is fake or not. Gold is unique. However, the most important questions about possible manipulation of the gold price concern much broader issues and occur at a much higher level. Well, the, the, the question about manipulation is, is clearly um, a, f a favoured one. People like to discuss this. I, I do think that um, even a cursory glance at historical fact will lead you in a fairly clear direction. I mean, it, it's not like this is a hidden thing. I mean, the London Gold Pool existed. It was an overt way of managing the gold price in terms of its, of its um, price. Uh, it's clearly in the interest of central bank to manage, particularly in the, in the, in the uh, monetary system as it functions right now, whether it does function or not being a slightly separate point, um, it's clearly in, in their interest to, to manage the risk-free rates. Would you influence the gold price? Well, it's said that gold is the reciprocal trust in central banks. You betcha. Um, would a cheaper gold price, notwithstanding the fact that central banks are the biggest holders of gold, 68% of their reserves are in gold, would you want to suppress it? You betcha. The problem's too big. Are they doing it? I don't know is the answer. But money, there's almost a racing certainty they probably are. Others, however, are far more confident, not only as to the question of whether the gold price is manipulated, but also who the culprits might be. Well, the gold price is absolutely manipulated. When I say that, I'm not, you know, uh, you know, implying some deep, dark conspiracy. I don't think Janet Yellen wakes up in the morning and thinks about gold. I don't think Janet Yellen knows anything about gold, to be honest. I mean, she's sort of a geeky, liberal labor economist who worships the Phillips curve. So I don't think Janet Yellen's behind some conspiracy to, you know, suppress the price of gold. But there's absolutely manipulation. And I've spoken to uh, um, uh, the, several experts. One is a a PhD statistician, so it's not a PhD in economics, it's a PhD in statistics, works for one of the largest hedge funds in the world. He looked at a 10-year time series, and he took, like, literally tick-by-tick -tick information on the COMEX gold future for 10 years. And he said there is no explanation for this data other than manipulation. It could not possibly have happened through normal market forces. In particular, he noticed that at the end of the day, like on the last trading tick, uh, on the COMEX, the price of gold got smacked down, and then at the open the next day, it could kind of pop up again. So he said, well, this is the easiest trade in the world. Just buy gold right after the close and sell it the next morning, you know, just before the open, and you'll just make consistent, steady profits. Well, anyone who knows anything about, about markets and uh, how they operate knows that you cannot 
make consistent steady profits. This is what Bernie Madoff said he was doing, right? So he said the probability that the price naturally goes down at the close and naturally goes up at the next point is like is zero after 10 years. And this is not inference. I mean, this is like DNA. Like, you know, you may not see the crime being committed, but if you have the DNA evidence, you can be pretty sure who did it. Governments everywhere throughout history um, have wanted to manage it's a critical national security, you know, whether you go back to the time of the Romans, etc. Value of a currency is very, very important to manage, particularly if uh, you're a government that hasn't managed your finances all that well. Um, and unfortunately, that is over time, most governments sooner or later find themselves in that position. And so the manipulation is right there in the open and that it, it is a creation of a of a derivative market that satisfies demand that would otherwise go to physical and that that was the goal of setting that up and that's not well understood I don't think by many market participants but uh, as I said it's there in black and white and on the historical archives when you see gold trade the way it trades when it drops you know someone sells three billion dollars worth of you know notional futures at 2 a.m. New York time um, you know, having been on Wall Street for 22 years, I know for a fact that if any buy side trader would execute an order like that on any consistent basis, they'd be out of a job very, very quickly. You know, they're they're clearly somebody not trying to get best, you know, best execution. And and if they're not trying to get best execution, what you're talking about is a currency intervention, basically. Uh, and so, you know, who is doing that? Is that Originally, the U.S. government had a very strong interest in managing uh, the, per the, the perception of the dollar through gold. So yeah, there was a, you know, famously in the late 1990s, Eddie George, an official with the, uh, I believe with the Bank of England in UK, you know, he famously said, we looked into the abyss, you know, if the gold price continued to rise, it would take, it would have taken down one major trading house and, and a number of others would have followed. And so there is a, you know, there is a, a sign there that the banks at that point had gotten involved in, you know, gold financing that have left them short gold in a way that any real rise in gold would have, you know, you know led to an existential threat to, to them. Yes, I think the price of gold is manipulated. And I think it's manipulated in a number of ways. I mean, certainly there is a, a concerted PR campaign against gold by central banks for the reasons that, that we've discussed. You know, they, they it is very specifically in the statist and central banker kind of interest to ensure a, a weak gold price. You don't want to see essentially the gold uh, price de facto recreating a sort of reserve currency by, by just being incredibly strong. So there's a there's a there's a, a constant barrage of negative publicity towards the gold uh, the gold industry. When it comes to specific manipulation of the gold price, yeah, I think that that is is probably likely too. I mean, I can't. Uh, the, the problem is we can't actually tell because of the way central banks don't, um, you know, are very are very opaque with what they do with their gold holdings and particularly their gold swap positions. But I think it's likely, and the reason why I think it's likely is because they've been manipulating other markets for a very long period of time. Now, historically, hedge funds were not players in gold. There was a few specialists, but, you know, they're doing stocks, bonds, or whatever. Well, they've sort of glommed onto gold. To them, it's just another commodity. It could be coffee beans, soybeans, lumber, who cares? It's a thing to trade. Well, if you're, um, uh, if you're short gold, like you've done some derivative contract with Goldman Sachs and you're short, it's easy to paint the tape. I mean, painting the tape just means manipulating the market through the gold futures market. Now, the other day, uh, well, recently, a few weeks ago, somebody sold 60 tons equivalent of paper gold. Now, I, I make the point, they didn't sell 60 tons of gold. They sold gold futures contracts that were equivalent to 60 tons. But I can sell 60 tons of paper gold with a phone call to my broker. All I need is a brokerage account. They got to put up some margin, like 5%. Uh, but that it drove the price down, uh, I, forget, I think, $20, $30 an ounce in, in a matter of minutes. Um, and so uh, if I'm short over here on the derivative side uh, and I dump the gold here and the price goes down and then all of a sudden I make money over here, or maybe I want to go long and I want to dry the price down and then buy at the bottom and ride it back up again. So perhaps unsurprisingly, hedge funds and bullion bank traders push the gold price around to try and make profits. 
But while gold remains a strategic asset which sits at the foundation of many nations' balance sheets, there are players far, far bigger than hedge funds who don't care about making a profit, but who have much broader and far stronger motivation to suppress the price of bullion. The, the important question is who's doing it and why. Um, there are, and, and the question I ask is why is it not being investigated by the regulatory authorities, by the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, et cetera. Now, one possible answer to that is that the Chinese are behind it and they're outside the jurisdiction. There's no way that a U.S. government agency is going to investigate the activities of China in our markets. China's too big, they're a sovereign nation that would not go anywhere. Uh, there could be a million diplomatic and national security and other reasons for not messing with China in that dimension. So China's my number one suspect because uh, people go, wait a second, they got all this gold, why would they want the price to go down? Well, the answer is they're still buying. Ultimately, they're going to want the price to go where it's going to go, which is $10,000 an ounce or higher. But they don't want that now because they're still buying. They're, they're playing catch up with the United States. And by the way, they've bought thousands of tons, which is a lot of gold, but they have thousands of tons to go to equal the U.S. in the gold to GDP ratio, where either in the absolute sense to get to 8,000 tons or in the proportional sense gold to GDP. Either way, they're still playing catch up with the United States. But not every gold market veteran buys into the idea that the gold price is subject to manipulation. It has to be said, some of the reasons they offer as to why the idea of a state-sponsored price suppression scheme may be far-fetched are both simple to understand and hard to argue with. I think that all financial markets are manipulated from time to time. Unlike many of my peers in the gold business, I have seen upwards price manipulation when that is easier. Long-term manipulation requires a conspiracy of a size that I don't think is possible. The idea is an example that the U.S. government, the Trilateral Commission, and the International Jewish Conspiracy, or whoever they are, could come together and do a three-decade-long manipulation in gold, forgets that the U.S. government can't educate the kids, it can't deliver the mail, it lost the war on drugs, it lost the war in poverty, it lost the war in Vietnam, and it lost the war in Afghanistan. How on earth could they organize a broad-scale manipulation when they can't even manage their own campaigns? Most governments eventually wind up manipulating the gold price uh, uh, to, to protect their own power. So it's certainly a possibility. I, I've never seen any hard evidence of that. And, and also I would say that it is the nature of gold to underperform other assets in a credit bubble. You don't need a nefarious Federal Reserve uh, pushing it down because that's what happens naturally in a credit bubble. Everything else goes up in terms of gold. And then, of course, when the bubble ends, as it must, uh, things crash in terms of gold. That is a natural thing. And it's, and it's really what we saw over the last 40 years, when, when, I mean, for example, from 2000 to 2008, gold went up in nominal prices, but went down in terms of oil and other commodities. So in fact, it, it did very badly uh, in real terms. Uh, when, when the bubble uh, had, a, had a popped in 2008 and 9, gold did fantastically well in nominal and real terms. And then Bernanke managed to uh, blow a, a bigger bubble. And so it's no really a surprise that gold did badly during that period. Now, it was, was the Fed manipulating downwards? I mean, it's possible, but we don't need that as a theory. But why would any suppression of the gold price be so important? And what might happen were it to be both exposed and shut down? In January 2018, a group of traders working for the big bullion banks became the latest market participants to be fined for trying to manipulate precious metals markets, a pattern that has been commonplace over the years. But this proof of price manipulation in the gold market, like many similar episodes which have gone before it, had no meaningful impact on the price. However, any manipulation in the gold market, like all price suppression schemes, will ultimately come to an end at some point. And when it does, the potential ramifications are enormous. All manipulations fail at the end of the day. They all fail. The 1968 London Gold Pool failed. Late 1970s, US and IMF dumped us Four, sorry, 1,700 tons of gold in the market. It failed. The price in 1980 was higher than ever. Uh, late 90s, we twisted uh, the UK's arm, got them to sell over half their gold. Um, now they're stuck. Uh, early 2000s, it was Switzerland's turn. We got them to sell about 2,000 tons. Uh, but the problem is we have now run out of suckers to sell the gold. In one day, the holders of paper gold would realize 
that they will never get delivery because there ain't any gold to deliver against it. And they will sit there with a piece of paper and whether it's COMEX or the bullion banks or uh, you know, all the people who deal in gold, they will default. And at that time, there just won't be any gold available and the gold price will obviously shoot straight up and it will be very hard to, f to buy gold. One of the core lessons of history is that the market is more powerful than governments. And when this bubble we're living in currently pops, it doesn't matter how much they try to manipulate it. Uh, gold will not be manipulated uh, uh, to that extent, so it will break out, whether they're manipulating it now or not. Alongside conspiracy theories and stories of manipulation, gold's history is filled with wonderful illustrations of how much it means to mankind, the extraordinary importance placed on protecting it and the sometimes deadly lengths people will go to in order to possess it. In September 1939, as the German army advanced towards Britain, the government decreed that every person living in the United Kingdom register their gold with the Royal Treasury. Just weeks later, on the 7th of October 1939, HMS Emerald set sail from Plymouth in Great Britain for Halifax, Nova Scotia. The reason? Her hull contained millions of pounds of gold bullion, bound for the USA to pay for American war materials. Twelve months later, with the war going badly for the Allies and the battle for the North Atlantic at its fiercest, Prime Minister Winston Churchill used emergency wartime powers to seize the gold that the citizens of the UK had been forced to declare the previous year. The gold was moved to the port of Greenock in Scotland in secret, reloaded onto HMS Emerald and then dispatched to Canada, so if the British were to be overrun by the advancing Nazi forces, they would still have the means to continue the fight. One week later, another convoy set off on the same route this time carrying $1.7 billion of gold. Today, that gold will be worth over $29 billion. In all, almost $30 billion of gold in today's money was shipped thousands of miles in treacherous seas and through a gauntlet of U-boats without a single ounce being lost. It was the single greatest and perhaps most dangerous movement of wealth in history. Stories such as the daring evacuation of Britain's gold during World War II are well documented. But alongside such historical tales, there are legends surrounding missing hordes of gold that have fascinated treasure hunters since time began. One such legend centers around a notorious Japanese general and a hidden gold stash which today would be worth billions. The legend of Yamashita's gold has endured for over 70 years and to this day attracts treasure hunters from all over the world who journey to the Philippines to search for billions of dollars supposedly looted from all over Southeast Asia by General Tomoyuki Yamashita, the notorious Tiger of Malaya. Yamashita's army stole gold from bank vaults, depositories and commercial premises as he cut a swathe through Asia, with the Japanese government intent on using their ill-gotten gains to finance their expanding war effort. The gold reached the Philippines on its way to Singapore from where it was to be shipped to Japan, but with the war in the Pacific escalating and the US Navy in the ascendant, it became impossible to move the gold. Instead, it was supposedly hidden somewhere deep in the Philippine jungle. Many of those who knew the location of the hidden treasure were killed during the war, and Yamashita himself was executed for war crimes in February of 1946, without giving up the whereabouts of the eponymous stash. In the intervening 70 years, hundreds of fortune hunters have sought Yamashita's gold. A treasure hunter named Rogelio Roxas filed a lawsuit in Hawaii against former Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos, who he accused of stealing the gold. But even that has failed to stop adventurers applying to the National Museum of the Philippines for a treasure hunter's permit. Roxas' lawsuit resulted in what was then the largest ever award made by a court, $40.5 billion, including damages. However, the amount was reduced on appeal to just $13 million. Roxas, however, died mysteriously on the eve of the trial and so never saw his treasure hunt come to its conclusion. The lawsuit concluded that Roxas found a treasure, but that the treasure in question may not have been that of Yamashita, a technicality which has been enough to maintain a steady stream of would-be Indiana Joneses heading for Manila. The colourful history which plays such a big part in mankind's attachment to gold stands in stark contrast to the situation facing us in the present as the world's ever-increasing reliance on debt to sustain a creaking monetary system threatens to bring the financial world as we know it to its knees. In episode one, we looked at how the gold standard worked and more importantly, perhaps, how it was ended by Richard Nixon on August the 15th, 1971. But is a return to the gold standard a possibility? And if so, what would a re-imposition of financial discipline mean for the modern day monetary system? Why is this a source of contention for so many people? 
it's a source of contention for people who like debt. In other words, governments, um, banks, uh, people who like to live beyond their means. So for them, it's a source of contention because uh, gold makes it impossible to borrow more than you can afford to repay. Uh, whereas with fiat money, you can essentially borrow without limit and then print the money to pay it back. So it's bad for people who uh, make money from producing additional money, like banks, fractional reserve banking. Uh, bad for central banks, bad for governments who like to wage wars and pay for them with you know, uh, tickets that they print in unlimited quantities. But I think it's good for everybody else. It's good for savers. It's good for people who uh, want to know that they can save money for retirement and that money be worth uh, the purchasing power, have the purchasing power that it had when they were setting it aside. Having some sort of gold standard is is very it, it, you would have a lot of antipathy towards that because that prevents you from fighting a war anytime you want it prevents you from promising you know medicare part d anytime you want it you know all of these things that um you know keep you in washington or keep you really in any country for that matter but in in particular given how the currency system has developed uh, over the last 30 40 years um you know, it's only the U.S. that has exorbitant privilege. There's the way the system is structured. There are other governors or breaks that exist for other countries that have not existed uh, for the United States uh, for a long time. And I think that that ultimately is why there's such a high degree uh, of um, establishment, you know, antipathy towards, towards, uh, towards the gold standard. Interestingly, when central bankers talk about the gold standard, they seem to be vaguely aware of its benefits. But what they say is that its costs are too high. And what are those costs? The costs are that the Fed and the government can't manipulate the economy. The idea is that under the gold standard, uh, you'd have terrible depressions and, and employment would be you know, very, very high levels. And there's nothing the government could do about it. And that cost is too high because the government can now stabilize prices. And of course, this is absolutely crazy because what created the bubbles uh, in the 19th century, in the early 20th century, were not, it was not the gold standard, it was the banking system. It was a flawed bank, the fraction of the banking system by its nature uh, blows bubbles and collapses. Nothing to do with gold whatsoever. And in fact, as we've seen when they switched the world from a gold standard to a dollar standard, we still get bubbles. And they're, they're worse than they ever were. So it's the stabilization that makes the problems. In fact, during the Great Depression in, in the 1930s, Hayek wrote that uh, it was the stabilizers in the 20s that created the problems. So, that they didn't let the market clear. They tried to keep prices too high. So I, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't the gold that did it, the gold standard that did it. It was the bank system that made all these bubbles. But uh, it, so it's, it's beyond bizarre to see uh, ben Bernanke get up and blame gold for all the problems that the bank system he was managing and now Yellen manages uh, is responsible for all these problems. I don't think sufficient gold in the world in our current position to be able to support it not without a readjustment in the gold price. I think someone came up with a figure of $35,000 an ounce. Um, the argument clearly for it would be that it would force upon the regulators, the official institute, the, the central bankers in particular, discipline in terms of QE. I suspect that there will be some moment in time, uh, a rebalancing, I think they're using the word reset. Nice soft word, perhaps a word like reset, that will occur in the next short few years and that something new will evolve and it might involve linking gold partly to gold or something else. I think that there'll be a lot of pressure on central banks to create a new currency that is linked to something that can't be QE'd and created out of thin air. You can't print this stuff. Once called a barbarous relic by John Maynard Keynes, gold is the oldest continuous medium of exchange known to man. So would a reset of some sort see gold continue to hold its position and remain the cornerstone of the modern financial system? In recent years, the emergence of cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin has ignited furious debate about gold's future in the monetary system, with many believing that cryptocurrencies finally obviate the need for gold. The most likely future, however, is not a case of winner-takes-all. Do I think that there's room, as a medium of exchange, for an algorithm that also obviates the need for trust is seamless and private, like Bitcoin, Absolutely. Do I want all of my savings stored in a unit of value whose only value is an algorithm? No. I, as a consumer of currency, want lots of currencies. And I want to pick and choose the utility at different points in time in my career for different purposes with regards to my life and my family's life. 
Bitcoin and gold are the competing faith systems. The nice thing about cryptocurrencies is that nobody owns it in the sense that it's a democratic arrangement through the distributed ledger. We all own the ownership of the block, uh, and you can then buy parts of it, bits or parts of the chain. In other words, you can't QE it. It has a discipline inherently built into the system. The problem is it's not used, it's not a medium of exchange. And quite probably the regulator won't like it either. It's challenging the position of the other cash guarantee, which is cash. Gold, of course, is yet another faith system. Uh, why is that worth £31,000? Who says it's worth £31,000? Well, the answer is, up against this particular number, let's make it £31,000, you've got hundreds of thousands of people who are looking to buy at a price just below that, and people looking to sell just above that. In other words, you've got a huge weight of argument on both sides of the bid and the offer to give it that price. And a shift of perception, geopolitics, will shift the, the numbers of people. And so the price is confirmed or authenticated by the weight of numbers of people trading it. I don't think governments will introduce these things, uh, you know, as a general rule. So the only way I could see gold really um, re-emerging in the currency system, and, and it's the cryptocurrencies are, have, have been fascinating for this, is, is, is through some form of market-driven reintroduction. And that's what the cryptocurrencies offer, right? And they really do, because now we, we don't need central banks for currency clearing internationally. We don't need, um, uh, you know, large, massive banking, banking institutions in order to settle trades. We, don't, we just don't need that. We can do it across the phone these days. We can do it through cryptocurrencies. And I think, you know, there is a much, much, much more efficient uh, currency waiting to happen that involves yeah, a cryptocurrency that sits on your phone, that you can trade with anyone in the world, you know, at zero cost, and the underlying, um, uh, the underlying sort of ledger-based entry um, is gold sitting in a vault in somewhere like Singapore or somewhere like Switzerland or somewhere, somewhere safe where the government's not going to steal it. And, you know, if you look at that, the whole monetary system based on essentially gold in a vault essentially uh, like the gold exchange standard, I could see that emerging. And I, I you know, I'm very, very, very excited by what, um, uh, by what cryptocurrencies offer, not just the gold world, but, but the whole world economy as a result of this. Because if you see um, the widespread adoption of a gold-backed cryptocurrency that is, you know, that people have confidence in, then you're going to see an awful lot of change. I think it's, it's, it's a fantastic development that we're seeing at the moment. Um, first of all, because people are actually discussing what is money again. They really care about those topics. Yeah? They, 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 they research it, they're, they're, they're arguing, they're uh, uh, discussing it on Twitter, on, on Facebook and whatever. I think that's, that's, that's great, yeah. There, there should be competition of currencies. And I know that with all those ICOs now, uh, when I heard initial coin offering for the first time, I thought it's a joke, yeah. It sounded like IPOs in, back in the days. And there's 95% of it is probably, prob probably rubbish, yeah. And they won't be around in one or two years. But I think with Bitcoin um, being created pretty similar to gold because of the stock to fl flow ratio with the inflation rate um, that is just given, um, I think with so much intervention in, 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 in the whole space, uh, I'm meeting so many brilliant uh, uh, young people that only see opportunities. While if you go to a, a conference uh, in, the, in the finance industry, people say, okay, there's compliance and risk management and there's new legislation. Everything is just so much administrational work. And when you talk to those young developers in the crypto space, they're only seeing opportunities. They're excited. Yeah? There's so much innovation going on and I just love that. And I think that many, many industries, especially the banking industry, they will get disrupted. Um, and, and I think for, for, um, for, for gold, I don't regard it as a, as a competition. Because honestly, I know many people that, that understand Bitcoin and they say, 
gold is totally fine, yeah? Charlie Morris once said that um, uh, Bitcoin is uh, electronic gold, something like that. There's lots of similarities. Um, so, so I think basically a combination of a cryptocurrency uh, and physical gold, and there's lots of projects at the moment, yeah? This will probably be the future, and uh, I, I'm really looking forward to that. So in, in a world that is clearly moving towards frictionless payment, uh, whether, it's, whether, it's, whether it's a crypt crypto outcome or whether it's just the blockchain solution to all these cost problems, delays, et cetera, in payment, it, it does look very obvious to me that we're heading to some form of unit that everybody uses everywhere. So what I think can happen if, we, if, if people work it out properly, and this clearly is not going to be the state's preferred solution. But, you know, gold reverts to its traditional role as the money of the people, rather than paper being the money of the state and the corporations. Um, and once its price is revealed, in other words, once people remember what gold is, what its role it is, what it's always been, what it can be again, then I think that pure mass will become un uninteresting. So I think that the cryptos will become... Basically, I think they'll fold into a uh, gold and silver transmission on the blockchain. Thus far, cryptocurrencies have yet to be tested in the white heat of a financial crisis, whereas gold is the one asset which has survived every single panic in recorded history intact. In 2008, gold's price fell initially, surprising many, but the reality was that gold was providing liquidity in an illiquid marketplace. Once markets stabilized and QE began in earnest, gold's price soared. But how can we expect gold to act in the next financial crisis? So I think it's very, I think it's very difficult uh, to speculate on what is going to happen to gold and what's going to happen to, uh, to how it's going to happen. But I think what is safe to say is that gold is inversely correlated to confidence in the financial system. And the fact that gold is independent from the governments, from the banking system, is what creates and scarce is what creates a tremendous potential uh, value. I don't think we're going to have another 2008. I mean, we're going to have something that's different from 2008. The reason I don't think necessarily that's going to be the same is because the problem that 2008 revealed, which is excessive debts uh, and excessive leverage, has essentially been kicked upstairs on the, to the sovereign level. And so what was a private debt crisis uh, is likely will come back as a sovereign debt crisis, which is a completely different animal with very different uh, parameters. So whereas a lot of people are telling me now, or I hear a lot of people saying, well, the banking system is much safer because the leverage is lower, because there's less rehypothecation, uh, the answer to that, well, that may be true, but if the currency in which they measure everything is debauched, is debauched or devalued, and that may happen overnight in a very different way, that what happened in 2008 happened. We, we know the end game. We know that all of these debts cannot be paid. We know that the unfunded liabilities cannot be met in, in terms of real purchasing power. So then the question is, how does that get resolved? Well, there are only a couple of ways it can get resolved. It's either through inflation or deflation. Deflation meaning defaults. In the likely event that we do have some form of situation similar to that of 2008, and no matter what form that event might take, gold remains one of the few ways that you can protect yourself and preserve both your wealth and purchasing power. Man's connection to gold is not just a financial one, however. History is filled with deeply personal stories that demonstrate gold's role as a store of wealth, as protection from government confiscation via inflation and debasement, and as an insurance policy that, when called upon, pays out in ways that change the lives of those who own it. I know a person who grew up in Vietnam, whose father was a translator for the U.S. military during the Vietnam War. And when the U.S. left Vietnam, they were unable to leave with the, United, with the U.S. forces. And so they were left behind. And having been left behind, they obviously were subjected to oppression by the uh, communist regime. It so happened that the family of 14, one of the uncles there, was a dentist. And he was able to accumulate over the next, whatever, 10, 12 years, a certain amount of gold so that in the late 80s, uh, this family was able to pay seven ounces of gold per person 
so times 14, over 100 ounces of gold, to get 14 seats on a boat that left Saigon in the middle of the night, uh, lost power, and the next day drifted at sea for a few days and eventually was towed to the Malaysian coast by the Malaysian Coast Guard. They spent two years in a camp for displaced persons. They eventually made their way to Singapore where the father was able to go to the U.S. Embassy, present his credentials, showed that he was a translator for the U.S. for interpreter for the U.S. forces and the whole family of 14 was given visas, visas to come to the United States. And that's, you know, these people's lives were saved. Uh, and what did it do? It's, you know, what did it take? It took seven ounces of gold uh, per person for a family of 14. And so I think that's as good an example of uh, gold being plan B as I can come up with. A couple years ago, I was at a wedding and some friends of ours, I was talking with some friends of ours and they were, uh, they were Russian and Ukrainian and had emigrated here. Uh, we're now American citizens. And we got to talking about what happened in the 1990s in Russia. They described to me uh, the woman, my, my, uh, her father had been a doctor in her village in the Ukraine. And she said, we'd had enough saved in the bank. He, we were the richest family in the village and we had enough in the bank uh, to buy five cars, uh, which for her, apparently for that village was quite a bit. And she said, they, they closed the banks for two weeks and when they reopened the banks, we took the money out, we bought groceries for one month. And, you know, the, uh, her husband uh, said, yeah, similar story, I was saving up to buy a motorcycle and uh, had enough saved to buy a motorcycle and my dad wouldn't let me buy it. Closed the banks for two weeks, banks opened back up, I took the money out and bought a carton of cigarettes. So I said to them, I said, so I probably don't need to explain to you, I said, how, how did gold do? And they both laughed and they said, anyone that had gold, silver, jewelry, they did, they did totally fine. I love the story of how the French spirited their gold out of France and off to Canada and various other places when the, when, the, when the Germans arrived. It's a great story and they have to make a movie out of it. I mean, it's really good. And basically what, I mean, they split up their gold reserves into, into tiny little portions and they went off on, you know, mule carts and fishing boats and, and they, they got their nation's wealth out of the country and they did it before the advancing army. I mean, it was, it's, a, it's a story of daring do and all of that sort of stuff, fantastic. I once heard a story about the Soviet Union um, where gold obviously was, was forbidden. You could go to jail if, if you had physical gold, but you were allowed to have uh, uh, wedding rings, golden wedding rings, and that was a smart guy. Uh, and, and he had like 50 wedding rings. So every month or every couple of months he went to the market and, and had just enormous purchasing power due to his gold ring. And I think this clearly shows that, that um, you just have to own at least some gold. Elemental it may be, but gold is also a complex and confounding subject which has fostered passionate debate since the dawn of civilization. Hopefully, over the course of our journey, we've helped you understand a little better why gold has been money to man for thousands of years, the complexities that make it worth over $1,000 an ounce, the way it's bought and sold around the world, and its place at the heart of the modern-day financial system. Our aim hasn't been to persuade or change minds, but rather to explain how this lump of yellow metal became the object of so much fascination, and why it remains, many thousands of years after its discovery, the one universally accepted money. We hope we've shed some light on some of the mysteries surrounding gold and helped give you a better idea as to its role in storing and protecting wealth. But when all's said and done, whether you or I individually believe gold to be money or not is completely irrelevant. Gold has stood the test of time, providing a stable store of wealth to mankind for millennia. And as we look to an increasingly uncertain future with fiat currencies across the globe under siege from rising debt levels, it remains the only money guaranteed to survive.